Morning everyone and uh, welcome to our online service on this 19th of April, the first Sunday after Easter. I hope that um, you guys are all surviving this lockdown. This isolation is indeed getting tougher by the week. But I pray that God will give you the strength to endure through this season by looking to Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. So let's uh, begin our worship this morning by singing the intro together. The Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence, let all the earth keep silence before him. Keep silence, keep silence before Today's call to worship is taken from Psalm 28, verses 6 to 7. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song I give thanks to him. And now is uh, the time for a praise and adoration, and after that we'll have our opening prayer by our sister Joyce. Good morning, church. Uh, our first song is This Life I Live. As we sing the song, let us remember that this life we live is not our own, for our Redeemer has paid the price. He took it to be his alone, to be his treasure and his prize. Continue on today's service singing praise to God. 
by his perfect sacrifice in Jesus, for we who were once enemies are now made friends. Let us now sing Jesus Thank You. verse 10 say, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. Lord our God, O great and almighty one, whose spirit fills heaven and earth, we thank you that you are our Father, and that in you we have refuge, wherever we must go as we serve you on earth. We thank that your life can be revealed in us and can flow through us so that the world may be blessed by you. Our loving and caring Father, protect us and strengthen us in times of trouble and sorrow. When we travel on new path, give us a spirit to show us the way that everything may lead to do the good and to honor you. Father, through your spirit, unite us in the unshakable hope that your will shall at last be done on earth as in heaven. Grant that we may rejoice in the certainty that whatever happens, our paths are met level and firm by your love and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Let's uh, continue our worship by singing Gloria Patri. Now, the reason why we sing Gloria Patri is twofold. Firstly, it is to acknowledge that we Christians do not worship a God in general, but we worship a triune God, one God who exists in three persons. And um, it is to remind us of the fact that all glory should go to that one God who is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So let's sing together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in extended version of the Lord's Prayer together. Uh, this prayer consists of different Bible verses uh, that cross references to the original Lord's Prayer. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. From the rising of the sun to its setting, may your name be praised and be great among the nations. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let heaven and earth praise you, the seas and everything that moves in them. Your kingdom come. May all the ends of the earth remember and turn to you, and all the families of the nations worship before you. For kingship belongs to you. You rule over the nations. You are our king, O God. You are the king of all the earth. Your throne is forever and ever. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Teach us to do your will. Let your good spirit lead us on level ground. Not our will, but yours be done. Give us this day our daily bread. You, our God, will su supply every need of, our, uh, of ours according to your riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Give us neither poverty nor riches. Feed us with the food that is needful for us lest we be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest we be poor and steal and profane the name of our God. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. We confess our iniquity. We are sorry for our sin. Have mercy on us, O God. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon our guilt for it is great. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We do not ask that you take us out of the world, but that you keep us from the evil one. Restore us. Let your face shine that we may be saved. For the glory of your name, deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This week's uh, memory verses is taken from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 to 6. It says, Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And now we're going to have our scripture reading. Uh, it is from John 17, verses 20 to 23, and it will be read by our brother Mark. Hey guys, today's Bible passage will come from John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. Pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father. Just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one, as we are one, I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know you sent me, and have loved them even 
as you have loved me. Uh, today's passage continues Jesus' prayer to the Father on the night before his crucifixion. And last time in John 17 verses 6 to 19, we saw how Jesus was praying for the 11 apostles. And how Jesus was asking that the Father would protect the apostles from disunity, from being lost, from the world and the devil. In today's passage, in John 17 verses 20 to 23, we see Jesus beginning to pray not only for the apostles, but also for everyone in the world who would go on to believe in Jesus because of the preaching of the apostles. Look what it says in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. You see, this assumes something, doesn't it? This verse assumes that the ministry of the apostles, after Jesus departs from this world to go back to the Father, that the apostles' ministry will be successful. Even though Jesus only had a handful of disciples left by the end of his ministry, Jesus can already see the future. He knows the future that his disciples will go on to make thousands of other disciples through their proclamation of the gospel. Why? Because the apostles will be aided by the power of the Holy Spirit who will be poured out from heaven to the earth to, to convict and to change people's hearts as the apostles preach. Because you see, that's the grace that Jesus purchased by His blood on the cross. So from verses 20 to 26, Jesus is specifically praying for you and I. We who have become believers in Jesus through the apostles. Because that's exactly who we are. We are all believers in Jesus today because of the apostles. Because we've all become Christians by believing in the words of the New Testament, which were all written by the apostles. So this prayer is for you and me. So what is Jesus praying to the Father for us about? We see in today's passage that Jesus is praying for our unity. Our unity. What it says in verses 20 to 21. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, before we go any further, I just want to say this. Okay, and this might surprise you. God the Father has already answered this prayer by Jesus. God has already answered this prayer by Jesus. Believers of Jesus, that is the true believers of Jesus around the world today are already one. We Christians are already united. And we are already together united to God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. This prayer request has been granted by God already. Now, you might think, how can that be? How can that be? Christians around the world are not united. We see all kinds of divisions in the church. There are all these different denominations out there. Christians are always arguing about stuff all the time. So how can you say that we are one? And my answer to that is, what you think or what you feel about this issue doesn't really matter at the end of the day. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is what God's Word says about this issue what God's Word says about this issue. And this is what God's Word says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 16, which is like the perfect commentary to Jesus' prayer in John 17. So look what God's Word says. 
Ephesians 2 verses 13 to 16. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, so these are the Gentiles, the non-Jews, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He, Christ Himself, is our peace, who has made us, that is, both Jew and Gentile, both one, and has broken down in His, in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So look what it says in these verses. Okay, What we see here, first of all, is that before the death of Jesus Christ, there was only one true division amongst human beings. There was only one division. There were not multiple divisions amongst human beings. There was only one division in the eyes of God. And that division was this, Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentile. That's it. No other division existed. The Jews were the chosen people of God. Okay, And then there was the rest of them, the Gentiles. Doesn't matter if you were a Greek or a Roman or a Scythian, or a Macedonian, or even a Chinese. In those days, God just saw you as a Gentile. He just saw you as a non-Jew. So Jew and Gentile, that was the only true division there was. Okay, So there was the, the ethnic descendants of Abraham, and then the rest of mankind. That's how God saw it. But what does it say in today's passage? In, today's pas in this passage, it says, Jesus Christ, by His cross, has broken down. Okay, that's past tense. Has broken down that only true division that existed. That dividing wall of hostility between the Jew and the non-Jew has been hurled down. It has been hurled down. Because Jesus in Himself, okay, through His life, death, and resurrection, He fulfilled all those ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. All those ritualistic laws like the festivals, the food laws, and especially the sacrifices. Jesus fulfilled them all. Jesus, in other words was what all those Old Testament rituals were all about. Jesus was what all those sacrifices in the temple were pointing to, because Jesus is the Lamb of God. So through Jesus' death, He abolished, He got rid of those external ceremonial laws by fulfilling them and therefore removed those ethnic markers that separated the Jews from the Gentiles. So that now, the only thing that matters is not who is your ancestor, or what's in your DNA. Do you have Abraham's DNA running in your veins? That's not what matters anymore. The only thing that matters now is, are you by faith in Christ? Or not? Are you in Christ or not? Do you belong to Christ or not? Okay, that's the only thing that matters now. Nothing else matters. And in this passage, we see that if you are in Christ, if you do indeed belong to Christ, then the Word of God declares that Jesus Christ has made you one with other brothers and sisters out there who also belong to this same Jesus Christ. In other words, in other words, here's, here's what that means. If you are truly in Christ 
and someone else that you know is also truly in Christ, then whatever division or wall that you think exists between you and that brother or sister in Christ is only superficial. It's only superficial. That wall between you and that brother in Christ is non-existent in God's eyes. It's not there. Because actually, whatever dividing wall of hostility that you think there is between you and that brother never really existed in the first place. Right? Because you guys are both Gentiles anyway. And the only wall that did exist, the Jew and the Gentile wall, Jesus Christ has hurled down by His blood on the cross. So there is now no division. There is no division between you and that brother in Christ. There is no division. It's all in your head. Of course. Okay, there may be differences in personality or opinions between you and that brother in Christ. Differences in personality. There may be differences in your approaches of doing things, of achieving the same goal. Of course. Why? Because God created each of us unique. Like our thumbprints. You see, unity doesn't mean uniformity. Unity doesn't mean that we have to be like clones of each other, exactly the same. There is unity in diversity. Okay, and that's what Jesus means in today's passage when He prays to the Father that they may be one as we are one. You see, God the Father and Jesus Christ, even though they're both equally God, even though they are both one in being and one in essence, they are not the same person. We've talked about this, right? The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. The Father and the Son have different roles in salvation. The Father is the one who sent the Son to us, and the Son is the one who died for our sins. The Father did not die for our sins. It was the Son. So there is diversity within the Trinity. Diversity, even though the three persons are perfectly one in purpose and perfectly united in mind and heart so that they are called one God, not three gods. So in the same way, there is diversity, there is unity in diversity amongst Christians too. And of course, this diversity includes things like differences in culture, differences in nationality, and language. But do those differences mean that there is a dividing wall of hostility between you and that brother in Christ who comes from a different culture than you? No. Maybe in your eyes, there is a wall. And if so, you need to repent. You need to repent. But in God's eyes, there is no wall between you and that brother. It is gone. The only wall, real wall there was, Jesus abolished by His cross. And that wall, it wasn't the wall in your head. Okay, so if you and that brother are truly in Christ, then you guys have already been made one. You guys are already united. It's not that you guys should try to become one. The fact is you guys are already one in Christ. That's what God's Word says. And you know, I really like this approach of thinking about unity amongst Christians because usually when we think about unity amongst Christians, we think of it as something that we need to try to achieve by our own strength, isn't it? We have to do it. It sounds like this impossible mountain that we have to climb. We think that we need to get united. But that's not what the Bible says about unity. 
Unity amongst Christians is something that only Christ was able to achieve and has achieved. And it took nothing less than His death to achieve this unity. He had to die for this unity. It's not something we could ever do just by having combined services or combined gatherings. That doesn't bring unity. Jesus had to do it. And He has done it. We are one. It's something that Jesus had to ask God for and something that God the Father has granted. We are already one. Okay, but you might ask. Okay, I get it. Okay, God has already answered Jesus' prayer in John 17 verses 20 to 21. We are already one in Christ Jesus by what Christ has done on the cross. But surely, but surely you've got to admit that there are divisions in the church that happen all the time. There are divisions. There are always Christians fighting with each other, whether it's online or offline. Christians are always fighting. There always seems to be bitterness and unforgiveness amongst Christians all the time. What do you say about that? How can you say we are already united? Well, firstly, okay, let me say this. There can only be true unity between a true Christian and another true Christian. Okay? A true Christian and a fake Christian cannot have unity. You see, those verses in Ephesians chapter 2 that we just read do not apply to people who are Christians in name only. They do not apply to so-called Christians who are not actually in Christ. Okay, So-called Christians that belong to a church but do not actually belong to Christ. People who do not actually have Christ as their personal King and Lord over their lives. Those verses in Ephesians do not apply to those Christians, those Fake Christians and Christians who are truly in Christ cannot become one. And they are not one. They are like oil and water. Why? Because they don't worship the same God. They don't have the same Jesus dwelling in them. They don't have the same God as their Heavenly Father. So they are not brothers and sisters in Christ. So there cannot be any unity between a true Christian and a false Christian. Okay, which is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 18 to 19, look what he says. I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. It's interesting, isn't it? This means... That there is a sense that division in the church must happen. That sometimes God must let divisions happen in the church. Okay, especially if, it's, if it is about essential doctrines of the Christian faith. If it is about the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Okay, if it, if it is about questions like what is the true gospel? Who is the true Jesus? Or how do we get saved? Okay, If the true gospel and the person of Jesus Christ is at stake, and that includes things like what, are, what the true Jesus said about human sexual ethics, for example, then there is a sense that divisions must happen. Why? To separate the sheep from the goats. That those who are genuine among us may be recognized, as Paul says. In other words, to purify God's church, to get rid of the hypocrites from God's church, or to get the true believers out from a hypocritical church. Because you see, the thing about true Christians is that because of the Holy Spirit who dwells in them, 
They have a spiritual backbone. In other words, true Christians cannot and will not ultimately compromise and agree on a false gospel or a false Jesus. They will not bow down. They will not give in because the Holy Spirit will not allow them to give in to that false gospel. Because you see, if you look at Jesus' prayer in today's passage, we see that Jesus not only prays for the believers to be united to each other, but he also prays for the believers to be together united to God. So it's not just unity amongst us that he prays for, but unity with the triune God. John 17 verse 21, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us. In other words, there is no such thing as us being united with each other as Christians at the expense of being disunited from the one true God. You see, Jesus here is not advocating for some kind of unity that doesn't care about the truth of God. It's uh, some kind of unity that looks for the, the lowest common denominator. You know, uh, which is what most of the ecumenical movements out there is all about. It's just about unity at all costs. Even, even, even if it means compromising on the truth of the gospel. That's not the kind of unity that Jesus is praying for. That's not called unity. That's called joint rebellion against God. So in the life of the church, there will always be some kind of division. Necessary division between the true Christians and the false Christians. It is inevitable. It's bound to happen. Why? Because those two do not belong to the same house. They don't belong to the same spiritual family. They don't worship the same God. So there's going to be divisions between them. And when that kind of division happens, on the surface level or to the outsider, it may look like Jesus' church is getting ripped apart. It may look like uh, Jesus' church is getting divided, but that's not how Jesus sees it. He sees it as simply these verses being fulfilled. John 15 verses 1 to 2. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does, be, does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You see, it is God who is separating the fruitless branches from the fruitful ones. It's God who's doing that, isn't it? So we cannot say that all division is automatic, automatically bad. Okay, we can't be that naive as Christians. We have to look closely into the nature of the division. What is this division about? What does this division reveal? Does it reveal who are the true and who are the false? If so, then it is just God doing His job as the vine dresser that He is. It's just God doing His job. Okay, but you might ask, yeah, but what about those divisions that are not about the essential doctrines of the Christian faith? What if it's just divisions about petty things, which is what we often see in the church? What if, what if two people in the church are genuinely in Christ? Okay, Two people are genuinely born again and they are saved believers of Christ, but these two are arguing about minor things that don't matter. We see that all the time, right? What, what about those kind of divisions? Well, you see, that's why Jesus doesn't stop praying at verse 21. He, he goes on. In verses 21, 22 to 23, Jesus prays for us. Not just that we may become one, but that we may become completely one. Eventually, complete unity. John 17 verses 22 to 23. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. 
I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You see, Jesus here doesn't just pray for unity, but complete unity. And this prayer, obviously, it hasn't been answered yet fully, has it? We Christians, we are one, as we saw, but we haven't arrived at this perfect unity. Okay, we're not there yet, because why? Because we're still sinners. We're still imperfect. So just like becoming Christ-like, complete unity amongst Christians is something that we need to continually strive for and aim towards. And when we do, in the end, we will eventually get there. That is, in the new heavens and the new earth. We will get there in heaven. Okay, but how do we get there from here? How do we go on to this complete unity? Well, look closely what Jesus says in verse 22. This is very important. Jesus has given us something by which we can go on to this complete unity. And what is it? It is His glory. He has given us His glory. What it says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Now, what does Jesus mean by this? How does Jesus giving us glory and us receiving glory from Jesus lead us to unity with fellow Christian? How does that work? Well, it works like this. Why is it that we have this unity with other Christians? Why? At the end of the day, it's because we want glory. We want glory. For example, okay, why were the disciples of Jesus fighting with each other all the time during Jesus' uh, earthly ministry? Why were they fighting all the time? It's because each of them wanted glory for themselves. They wanted glory. So they were arguing all the time. For example, Mark chapter 9, verse 34. On the way, they had argued with, each, with one another about who was the greatest. Okay, can you just imagine the conversation that was going on? Like, I'm the greatest. And another apostle is like, no, I'm the greatest. And another one's like, no, 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 I'm the greatest. They're like a, they're like a bunch of children, right? So this argument, this division was caused by a desire to be great. Each of them want to be great, which led to this division. It was fueled by this thirst for glory. Again, in the next chapter, look what it says. Mark chapter 10. See, they keep doing this. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him, Jesus, and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant, that is, angry, at James and John. So another division is happening amongst the apostles. Why? Because, again, they want glory. They want glory, like James and John are coming to Jesus and they're asking basically, we want to be number two and number three in God's kingdom. Okay, and the other apostles are angry at them because they're saying, no, we want to be number two. We want to be number three. How dare you ask to be number two and number three? So another division. So you see here, divisions, arguments, and anger almost always happen because we want glory. Okay, call it recognition or approval or whatever we want, but I'm just going to call it glory. It's because we want glory. Isn't that right? We get jealous of other Christians because they have the greater gifts, the better gifts. 
than we do. We get jealous of other Christians who have the higher positions in society, society than we do. We get jealous of other Christians who have bigger or more influential ministries than we do. I'm guilty of that. We get jealous of the praise that those Christians receive from the world, from, the, from people. And secretly in our hearts, we get angry with them. We get angry. Why? Because we want the glory, the recognition, the approval that they have. So what is Jesus' cure for this? What is Jesus' cure for this hunger, this thirst for glory that we all have, which often leads to divisions? Hey, this is Jesus' cure. Jesus gives us His own glory to us. His own glory. Okay, look what it says. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. What does this mean? It means that in Christ, we believers, as God's children, we get to share in the glory of Jesus Christ in every possible way except His glory as God. We get to share in Jesus' glory. That's what that means. Romans 8, verses 16 to 17. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Fellow heirs with Christ. That's who you are if you're a true Christian. Isn't that amazing? It means that everything that Jesus owns, you own. And what does Jesus own? Everything. You see, the Bible says that in the kingdom of God, we will reign together with Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. We're going to reign with Christ in His kingdom. In fact, there is a sense that we are already reigning with Christ now. Because look what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 5 to 6. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him, Christ, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are we seated? In Christ, with Christ. We're seated on the throne of Christ. Because that's where Jesus the King is sitting, right? He's sitting on the throne and we are sitting on the throne with Him and in Him. Yes, Jesus rules over us as the ultimate King. But in Him, we also get to share in all that kingly authority and glory over all the powers that Jesus possesses. Isn't that amazing? But how is that possible? How is that possible since we are sinners who don't deserve such honor and glory? We are sinners who deserve nothing but shame for our sins. How is that possible? It's possible because Jesus on the cross, out of His great love for us, assumed our place of that eternal shame that we deserve, so that in Him we may assume His place of eternal glory with Him. You see, that's the kind of glory that we have and will enjoy forever. Glory purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. And if that's the kind of glory that we've been given, why would we seek any other lesser glory? Why would we be jealous and envious of anyone else and start arguing and getting angry with people when we have the very best thing there is, which is the glory of Christ shared with us? And so if we want to go on to complete unity with other Christians, we need to first of all stop seeking our own glory. Stop seeking our own glory and focus, dwell on the glory that Jesus Christ has already given us at the cost of His blood. 
And when we do that, the more and more each of us becomes satisfied with that glory and honor that Jesus gives us through His cross. And thus we become more and more united with each other in love and humility and gentleness towards one another. Then Jesus tells us in today's passage that something amazing is going to happen. The entire world is going to be converted to Jesus because of our unity. Look what he says. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You see, the reason why the world is going to believe in Jesus because of our unity is because the world has never seen such a display of unity on the earth. You know, in uh, 2018, so this is a very recent survey, there was a survey conducted in 27 countries, including Australia, around the world. And the survey mainly asked this question, do you think that the society in your country is divided? And um, a whooping 76% of the people they interviewed said, yes, I think our society is divided. So that's almost three quarters of the people in the world thinking that there is no unity in our society. And it's true, right? We live, we live in a divided world. We are divided over our political views. We are divided over the rich and the poor. The rich and the poor are divided. Men and women are divided. The young and the old are divided. Not to mention the constant tension between nations and different ethnicities that only seems to be getting worse by the day. Okay, to such a divided world, we Christians need to display a kind of unity that the world has never seen before. We need to display a kind of unity that is out of this world. Because that's what the people of the world are longing for. You see, we human beings, human beings are made in the image of the triune God. The one God in three persons. So that means whether they believe in that God or not, Human beings are always naturally yearning. They are naturally yearning for that kind of perfect unity in the midst of diversity. But they can't find it. They can't find it because it's only found in God. That kind of perfect unity in diversity is only found in the Trinity. But these people are trying to achieve that unity without God. And it's not working. And they're frustrated. Okay, so it is up to us Christians who do have this tri triune God dwelling in us, in our midst, to display that Trinity-like unity that the world has never seen. And when the world sees it, Jesus says in today's passage, they will confess that Jesus is real. They will confess that Christianity is real because they will say, there is no way this kind of unity is possible if it is not from God. And they will become believers. That's what Jesus promises in today's passage. So let us strive and aim towards that perfect unity that Jesus prays for. How? How do we do that? By fixing our minds on the glory that is and will be ours because of what Jesus, our Lord, has done for us. Okay, let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for reminding us that we who are in Christ, that we have all been made one with one another in Christ. Forgive us for those walls that we always build in our hearts between us and other brothers and sisters in Christ. Forgive us for doing that when your son has died to hurl down the only wall there was. Help us to see that unity is not something that we 
need to achieve by our own strength, but it is something that only Christ could and did achieve through the gospel. Father God, forgive us for desiring glory, recognition and approval from people. Lord, this has often led to envy and arguments and anger and divisions amongst us. Help us to focus only on that eternal glory that we have from your son Jesus at the cost of his death. May we relish in that. May we be satisfied in that. And Father, it will stop all our jealousy and fighting with one another. And it will lead us to increasing unity. It will help us go on to that complete unity that Jesus desired. Unity through which the entire world will be converted to Jesus Christ. So Lord, we with Christ, we pray, make us one as you and your Son are one. In your Son's precious name we pray. Amen. Now let us receive the blessing from God. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of God the Father and the fellowship and the help of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.